What's up? Merite here. Let's continue the anatomy of the central nervous system. In this segment, we will cover the complete anatomy of the different parts of the diencephalon. So the central nervous system consists of two parts, the encephalon and the spinal cord. The encephalon is then further divided into specific parts. We have the brainstem, which consists of the medulla, pons, and the midbrain, or the mesencephalon. We have the cerebellum back here, then the diencephalon and the telencephalon. Our focus in this video is going to be the diencephalon, which is here. So in this video, we're first going to look at the topography of the diencephalon, basically understand where is it, what parts are considered the diencephalon, and what's the orientation between these parts. After that, we will cover the actual anatomy of all the structures that make up the diencephalon, but let's orientate and understand their relationship first before doing so. Alright, so here we see pons, medulla, cerebellum, and the spinal cord, and if you remove one side of the hemisphere, we will be able to see the midbrain. And right above the midbrain, we have our diencephalon. So the diencephalon is a group of nerve nuclei that surrounds the third ventricle. So let's repeat the ventricular system a little bit. I'm sure you remember the fourth ventricle, which continues down as the central canal and continues upwards as the aqueduct of the midbrain, which leads into the third ventricle. So again, the diencephalon surrounds the third ventricle. And just above the third ventricle, on either side, we have the lateral ventricles. Alright, so the diencephalon surrounds the third ventricle, and its job is to connect different parts of the telencephalon with the brainstem. So, it's like a post office of our brain, directing the signals to the right place. So let's now remove the surrounding structures that are not significant to us yet, and orientate around the different parts of the diencephalon. So the diencephalon consists of five parts. And that includes the thalamus, epithalamus, subthalamus, metathalamus, and the hypothalamus. Now, I made an orientation scheme that really helped me orientate around the diencephalon when I started studying it. So, we can start off here, looking at the medulla, pons, midbrain, and the cerebellum. Now, let's say this is you, right? A cute little figure swimming in the cerebrospinal fluid within the fourth ventricle. Now, we're going to send you off for some adventure. So you swim upwards, up through the aqueduct of the midbrain, until you get to the third ventricle. From your standpoint right now, when you look to your right and to your left, you will see the thalamus on either side of the third ventricle. So if we go back to our list, thalamus is our first stop. So let's go ahead and put a check mark here. Now you decide to turn around and swim to the very back of the third ventricle where you'll notice a small pouch hanging on the back here like a tail called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland is attached to the backside here through the habenula. All of these together form the epithalamus. So let's go ahead and put a check mark here as well. Next, now, if you duck, kind of look inferiorly to the thalamus, you will find the subthalamus. This is another important component of the diencephalon. Then on the lateral side of each thalami, you'll find two nuclei called the medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body. These two nuclei are termed metathalamus, which is another significant part of the diencephalon. Now you decide to turn around and swim forward to explore what's on the anterior side. And what you see is surprising. You will see gray matter surrounding the anterior portion of the third ventricle, which is termed hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is going to be more of an area that structures are going to be a part of, like the miliary bodies. Then there are a bunch of hypothalamic nuclei around in this area. Some of these nuclei have axons going down as the tuber cinerum, which form a stalk called the infundibulum that connect to the posterior part of the pituitary gland, also called the neurohypophysis, since it contains neural fibers. The anterior part of the pituitary gland is not considered a part of the hypothalamus, since it's glandular, meaning it has a different origin during development. Other parts that are considered a part of the hypothalamus are the optic schism and the optic tract. Some sources say they are their own part of the diencephalon, called the thalamus opticus, and some sources include them as a part of the hypothalamus. In this video, we will count them as a part of the hypothalamus, but you know, keep that in mind. So all of these structures are going to be a part of the hypothalamus. Now, let's work our way down the list, starting with the thalamus. So I think the best way to learn its anatomy is to go through all the structures one by one, starting with the external features and then the internal ones. So the thalamus is here in green. 
and if you look at it from a posterior perspective, you will see the thalamus on either side right here. The most anterior part of each thalami form a tubercle shape, we call it the anterior tubercle, and the posterior end is more rounded part, it's called the pulvinar. And in between the right and the left thalami, there is a connection point, which is called the interthalamic adhesion, that connects both thalami together. So those are the only external features I'm going to tell you to remember. Anterior tubercle, pulvinar, and the interthalamic adhesion. Now let's slice the thalamus and look at it from a superior perspective. We will see this. Okay, this is the thalamus. The thalamus is an egg-shaped structure and is divided into three different kind of nuclear groups by this little Y-shaped structure. This Y-shaped structure is called the intermedullary lamina. Sometimes it can also be referred to as the medial medullary lamina. The nice thing about the internal medullary lamina is that it's actually a white matter structure. The second thing that's really cool is that it separates the thalamus into three different groups. The first one that we're going to talk about is the anterior group of nuclei within the anterior tubercle. Then we have the medial group of nuclei and the lateral group of nuclei. Alright, now the thalamus is actually, you know, when you're learning about it, it can be quite daunting. Especially when you look in the books and they got all these nuclei and you're like, what the crap is going on? I'll only focus on the very basic neuroanatomy of it so that you kind of have a good ground base in understanding the thalamus. So let's do the anterior nuclei first. The anterior nuclei is a part of a circuit responsible for emotional episodic memory. Now, what does that mean? That means your ability to recall and mentally re-experience specific episodes from one's personal past. So this is the one that keeps you awake at night when your brain goes wandering off about awkward situations you've been in. And it can do that because it's a part of what is called the limbic system. And we will talk about the limbic system in detail when we go through the internal structures of the hemispheres. But the limbic system is initially responsible for control of emotions, behavior, motivation and memory. And it's a system that consists of several parts. And the ones that are involved with the anterior group of nuclei are, you know, the thalamus itself, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the cingulate gyrus, and the fornix. So all of these structures are involved with the anterior nuclei of thalamus. Let's see how. So the mammillary body, which is a part of the hypothalamus, sends fibers to the anterior thalamic nuclei. From the anterior thalamic nuclei, they send their axons to the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus then send axons downwards and they eventually reach the hippocampus. Then from the hippocampus, fibers go through the fornix and then finish the circuit in the mammillary bodies again. This whole circuit is called Pepe's circuit and this is the circuit that gives you the ability to recall and re-experience past memory for emotional episodic memory. So that is the anterior group of nuclei. Next, we have the medial group nuclei, or also called the medial dorsal nuclei. And what these nuclei do is that they relate the sensory input, motor input, and olfactory input with emotions, meaning gives you emotional aspect of smell or any sensory or motor input. And it's able to do that because it receives its fibers from the olfactory cortex, which is the area that perceives smell. And it also receives input from the amygdala, which is involved in fear, aggression, anxiety, and all of those kind of emotions. So it will send its input to the medial dorsal nucleus. And then there's the hypothalamus. So all of these send their axons to the medial dorsal nucleus. And once the medial dorsal nucleus receives all of those emotions, it sends that information to the prefrontal cortex, which is an area responsible for attention, personality, abstract thinking, and all of those things. Cool. So that is the medial dorsal nucleus. Now, let's do the lateral group of nuclei. The lateral group of nuclei is divided into the lateral dorsal row and the lateral ventral row. And all the way on the back here, we have the pulvinar. The lateral dorsal row is divided into two portions. It's divided into the lateral dorsal nuclei and the lateral posterior nuclei. The lateral dorsal, lateral posterior and the pulvinar are mostly involved in the visual and auditory senses. And I'll show you in a bit when we talk about the medial genital body and the lateral genital body. So we'll put these on hold a little bit. But let's talk about the lateral ventral row. This is actually the most important part of the thalamus. And it consists of the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral. These two nuclei are a part of the basal ganglia. 
Remember, the basal ganglia are also subcortical grey matter and they are responsible for coordinating, starting and stopping voluntary movements. They include the caudate nucleus, putamen, globus pallidus externus and internus, thalamus, but not the whole thalamus, only the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral group of nuclei are going to be a part of the basal ganglia. That is why they are special. The last ones are the subthalamic nuclei at the substantia nigra of the midbrain. So, if we take all the structures of the basal ganglia and group them all together, we will see that the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nuclei are also going to be responsible for initiation and planning of movements. And it does that by the basal ganglia structures receiving impulses from the primary motor cortex. Impulses within the basal ganglion are going to go through the ventral anterior and the ventral lateral nuclei, which are then going to end up back towards the primary motor cortex for a better planning and initiation of movements. Another thing that's kind of special with the ventral lateral, in addition to the basal ganglia, is, you know the cerebellum? The cerebellum is involved in receiving information about proprioception, meaning it receives information about position of your muscles, your tendons, your joints, your ligaments. It receives all of that information through the spinocerebellar tract and the external arcuate fibers. It also receives information from the inner ear, you know the vestibular system, which is involved in balance. The cerebellum receives information from the inner ear through the vestibulocerebellar tract, based upon our equilibrium. It also receives a pre-planned motor plan through the cortico ponto cerebellar tract, which remember, either goes to the red nucleus and then down as the rubrospinal tract, or it ascends back up through the thalamus, or specifically the ventral lateral nucleus. So the cerebellum receives all of that information about balance, proprioception, the motor plan and all of those things, and then it sends it to the thalamus, and then the signals are sent up to the cortex. What area of the cerebral cortex you say? The primary motor cortex. This is a very cool and controlled process. All of this just to move a finger or a limb. The last two nuclei are the ventroposterior lateral nucleus, or abbreviated as VPL. It receives sensory information from the trunk and limb through a tract that you're probably familiar with by now. That tract originates from the gracile fascicle and the cuneate fascicle. They're responsible for epicritic sensibility meaning proprioception, and mechanoreceptors, like touch and vibration. They will ascend as the medial lemniscus and then go to the VPL nucleus to be directed towards the primary somatosensory cortex. Another tract it receives input from is the spinothalamic tract. And remember, this tract is responsible for sensation in regards to pain, temperature, pressure, and touch. The spinothalamic tract goes to the VPL and then up to the somatosensory cortex as well. So that is the ventroposterior lateral nucleus. The other nucleus is the ventroposterior medial nucleus, or abbreviated as the VPM. These nuclei are also sensory nuclei, and they receive sensory information from the face as well as gustation, or the sense of taste. It receives its senses from the trigeminal nerve, through the trigeminal lemniscus, about proprioception, pain, touch, and all of those things in the facial region. So that is this one. The other one is gustation, or taste. You know, there are specific cranial nerves responsible for the sense of taste. These are the facial, grossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve. All of them will go to the VPM. And then from the ventroposterior medial nuclei, they will give off axons towards the primary somatosensory cortex. Awesome. Now we're done with the thalamus. From this view, we can talk about the metathalamus, which remember are the medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body. The medial geniculate body is associated with hearing, so it's a part of the auditory pathway. This pathway starts around the cochlea of the inner ear, which converts hearing into nerve signals through the hair cells. From here, these nerve signals are sent through the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nuclei in pons. The cochlear nuclei will then cross to the other side and form the trapezoid body of pons and then they will ascend as the lateral lemniscus to the inferior colliculi. Then through the brachium of the inferior colliculus, the axons will reach the medial geniculate body and then reach the primary auditory cortex, which is located at the superior temporal gyrus. So that is the medial geniculate body. The lateral geniculate body is related to vision, so it's associated with the visual pathway. 
So remember, within the retina of your eyes, you have receptors for the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. The fibers of the optic nerve will go back and then half of the fibers will cross and form the optic chiasm. After that, they will synapse with the lateral geniculate bodies and from the lateral geniculate bodies, the fibers will go back to the occipital lobe, which is where you'll find the primary visual cortex. And when the fibers go to the primary visual cortex, that is when you're consciously aware of the things you see around you. But fibers also go from the lateral geniculate bodies to the superior colliculi through the brachium of the superior colliculi. The superior colliculi are responsible for coordinated movement of the eyes and neck and is able to do that through the tectospinal tract, which sends motor impulses for the eyes and the neck muscles. So the superior and the inferior colliculus is responsible for reflective movement of the head and neck through visual and hearing stimulus. Now, remember we talked about the pulvinar and the lateral posterior and the lateral dorsal nucleus? They're actually involved in all of those things, but the pulvinar especially will receive fibers from the medial geniculate body about hearing, lateral geniculate body about vision, as well as superior colliculus for reflexive movement of the head through visual stimulus, and inferior colliculus for reflexive movement of the head through auditory stimulus. All of those go to the pulvinar, and the pulvinar sends the information primarily to the tertiary areas in the brain, which gives you the possibility to take past experiences, let's say someone's face, or maybe in a flower or a facial expression, and it helps with recognition. It gives meaning to the image you're seeing. That is what the pulvinar is responsible for, taking all of that information and sending them to the association areas, or the tertiary areas, and the secondary areas in the brain. So that was the metathalamus. Boom, let's move on. The next one on our list is the epithalamus. So let's go back to this image. We're already familiar with the thalamus now, but on the posterior side, we can see the epithalamus right here. The epithalamus is a very small area and it consists of mainly the pineal gland. And the pineal gland mainly produces one of the most important hormones in our body. And that is the hormone that makes you sleep called melatonin. So essentially, it regulates the sleep-wake cycle. The pineal gland is attached to the posterior part of the thalamus. On either side of the pineal gland, you will see a triangular-like structure called the habenular trigone, which is white matter that contains some habenular nuclei, which are considered to be a part of the limbic system. Between the habenular triangle, we will find the habenular commissure, which connects both habenular trigones together. And you will also find the posterior commissure here as well. So that is the epithalamus. Next, let's do the subthalamus. They're called subthalamus, so under the thalamus. So here's the thalamus, here's the subthalamus, or the subthalamic nuclei. The subthalamus is essentially a part of the basal ganglion. So all the other structures of the basal ganglion will work together with the subthalamus to help start movement, stop movement, and coordinate voluntary movements. So that is all I had for the anatomy of the subthalamus. Let's now do the last part of the diencephalon, which is the structures you'll find around the anterior portion of the third ventricle, called the hypothalamus. Really what I want you to understand, rather than going detailed into the neuroanatomy, is to know that the hypothalamus is more of an area that are made up of different parts, or different nuclei. And it has some external parts that are considered a part of the hypothalamus. Remember, the optic pathway has the optic chiasm and the optic tracts. Both of these are considered a part of the hypothalamus. As mentioned earlier, some sources mention these as a separate part of the diencephalon as thalamus opticus. But here we will include them as a part of the hypothalamus. So if you look at the diencephalon from an anterior perspective, we will see the hypothalamus here in red and the optic chiasm and the optic tract right here. Awesome. Now, the other parts of the hypothalamus are going to be the mammillary bodies, and they're responsible for emotional episodic memory, as mentioned earlier, as well as reflexes associated with olfaction. Remember earlier when we went through the Pepe's circuit associated with the anterior nuclei of the thalamus, where we have the thalamus, hypothalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, cingulate gyrus, and the fornix? The mammillary body will send axons to the anterior nuclei of thalamus, which will send its fibers to the cingulate gyrus, and then to the hippocampal area, and then to the fornix and back to the mammillary body. 
This circuit will be responsible for emotional episodic memory, which is the emotional reaction to past memory. So that was the mammillary bodies. Other things we'll find in the hypothalamus are these hypothalamic nuclei. There are many nuclei in the hypothalamus. Some of them send down their axons through the tuber cinerum, which will get tighter and form a stalk called the infundibulum, which will then synapse with the nuclei in the posterior pituitary gland. So hormones released from the posterior pituitary gland, like vasopressin or oxytocin, gets their trigger stimulus from the hypothalamus through these fibers. So those are the major structures of the hypothalamus. If you want to go deeper into the neurology of it, we can look at a side view of the hypothalamus and really look at all the hypothalamic nuclei. They're arranged into areas like the lateral hypothalamic area, the posterior hypothalamic area, and the anterior hypothalamic area. These nuclei are responsible for different things. The paraventricular nuclei are associated with pain, for example. The preoptic nucleus decreases the heart rate and the blood pressure and many other things. Look at the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a part of the circadian rhythm, the sleep-wake cycle. Supraoptic nucleus for thirst. Arcuate nucleus, which regulates the release of many hormones. Ventromedial nucleus for the satiety feeling. This nucleus doesn't work in my body, I'm always hungry. Then we got our mammillary bodies here. The dorsomedial nucleus for the sleep regulation and food intake. You might want to go in detail into this when you study the physiology or neurology, but for now, that was the anatomy of the diencephalon. If you found this video helpful, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. The next video is going to be about the telencephalon.